All right, now it's not like you've never heard of objects before. In the fundamentals course, we did lots with objects, but we're going to kind of dig a little bit deeper with objects now. So to kind of refresh, everything in Windows PowerShell, everything is an object. Even a string, just like the letter A by itself, is an object. It's a string object. A number is a number object. A service is a service object. They're all objects. And if you pipe an object to the get member commandlet, get member will reveal the properties and methods of that object. Those are called members. Properties, member methods together, it's all members. So when you start working with an object members, that is when you start working with a great deal of functionality that those objects have. That's where all their, their capabilities are, their features, if you will. For example, string objects contain methods for string manipulation. If you've worked with a language like VBScript or, or maybe Perl, you're used to having a lot of built-in functions that trim a string or take bits of a string out or replace parts of a string. PowerShell doesn't have those built-in functions. Instead, all that capability exists as methods of a string object. Date time is the same thing. The date time type contains methods and properties for formatting and working with dates and times. You can format a date as a short date, as a long date, get just the year, get just the month, whatever you need. So PowerShell really doesn't provide commandlets or built-in functions that do all these things because instead it's building them right into the objects. Strings have a number of useful methods. In fact, much of the functionality provided by intrinsic functions in languages like VBScript are provided as methods of the string type in Windows PowerShell. Some of the more useful methods include ends with, which tells you if a string ends with a particular character or not. Index of and index of any help you find the location of a substring within a larger string. Insert allows you to insert a substring into a string. Pad left and pad right allow you to pad a string with spaces to make it meet a specific number of characters, while remove allows you to remove a substring from a larger string. Let's start by specifically typing a variable as a string and then assigning a simple string of characters to it. If we then pipe this to get member, we can see that it is indeed a string variable. It's always a good idea to be sure. So let's start using some of these properties and methods that get member tells us we have. Many of the functions built into languages like VBScript or Perl are provided as members of the string type within PowerShell. To start with, let's see if our string starts with the letter H. It does. Let's replace the letters L, O with P, creating a new string. What if we get a substring, starting at the second character? Now let's create a lowercase version of the string. Let's use the one property of the string type to see how long it is. And let's see what character position the first L occurs at. Finally, let's take our string and pad it with spaces on the left to equal a total of 20 characters. As you can see, Strings have a lot of built-in functionality. As with strings, most of the capabilities for manipulating dates and times are provided as members of an object type, in this case, the date time type. Various add methods are available to add specific time periods, such as adding a year or even subtracting 30 days from a given date. A subtract method is also available. Methods like isDaylightSavingsTime help you examine the context of a date time, while conversion functions like toFileTime allow you to represent a date in various standardized formats. Methods are also available for extracting just a portion of a date time, such as the month or hour. To experiment with dates, I'll start by typing a variable as a date time and then assigning it a date value. Notice that I can give it a string which looks like a date based on my computer's regional settings. Because $D is typed as a date, PowerShell will interpret the string into the equivalent date time value. We can test that by viewing what's in $D and seeing that PowerShell displays the date using its default full length date time format. Piping it to get member also confirms that it's a date and reveals the many things we can do with date objects. For example, we can add two years to the date and get a new date. We can get just the day of the week that this date represents, or we can add a negative 30 days. That's the way to find a date in the past, by adding a negative number of time units. We can retrieve just the month portion of this date, or convert the date into a file system date time format. We can display other date formats too, including a short date string. 
Many of the date handling functions provided in other languages like VBScript or Perl are available as members of the date time type within PowerShell. PowerShell has a lot of data types you can work with. Here are some of the more useful ones. String, obviously, date time, XML, which lets you really work with whole powerful XML documents, process, service controller, which is the type of object that represents a Windows service, event log entry, you can probably guess what that's for, and a lot more. Really, you can still use get member to find these. Any commandlet or anything that returns an object, just type it to get member, and you'll find out what type of object it is, as well as seeing its members. So, let's talk about using those members in the pipeline. Kind of the tricky thing about these members is you can't use a member for an entire collection of objects at once. So let's take a, a Windows service as an example. I said that was a service controller object. Well, service controllers have methods like start and stop and pause and restart and so forth, things you would expect to be able to do with a service. You can't just get a bunch of services and pipe them to a method like pause because that's not how methods work, unfortunately. So there are some tricks to using these things in the pipeline when you need to, and we're going to take a look at what those are. The for each object commandlet allows you to take a collection of objects and then execute a method of those objects one at a time for each object in the collection. In other words, you might have a collection of WMI disk objects where you execute their defrag method one at a time. In this example, I've created an array of string objects and piped them to for each object, or, or rather its alias, the percent sign. I'm executing the string objects starts with method one at a time for each of the three string objects I piped in. To work with individual properties, use the select object commandlet. Here I'm piping in three string objects and just selecting their length property. This is a bit more intuitive than using for each object to work with methods. So let's see how to use some of these object members in the pipeline. I'll start by using WMI to retrieve all installed services and store them in a variable called services. From there, we'll pipe that to select object to get just the name, state, and start mode properties. Notice that piping the variable and its contents works just fine. Alternately, I could have saved typing by just using get WMI object to get the services and piping them directly to select object, same thing. So that's how you work with an object's properties in the pipeline, by selecting the properties you want using select object. But what if we wanted to execute the interrogate service method of each service? We can't do that to all of them as a batch. We have to run it for each service in turn, and we do it by piping the services to for each object, and inside the for each object code block, calling the interrogate service method. So let's see a practical use of this. I'll use getWMI to retrieve all of the Win32 service objects. I'll filter so that I'm only keeping the ones whose state is not running and whose start mode is auto. In other words, services which are set to start automatically but which aren't running. I'll pipe those to for each object and have it execute each service's start service method, attempting to start those services which should be running but aren't. Pause this video and use your lab guide to complete the tasks in the lab. When you're finished, resume playing the video, and I'll walk you through a sample solution. Let's see what I came up with for lab 2-1. These answers all assume I've created a text file at c test text.txt, which contains several lines of, of just random text. For task 1, I'm using get content to retrieve the file's contents and piping them to for each object. Remember that each line of text within the file will be delivered as an object, so for each object, is acting on each line, which is a string object, and executing its trim method. For task two, I do almost the same thing. I execute the to upper method first, though. The result of that is a string, which has all the properties and methods of any string, and so I execute the uppercase strings replace method, replacing x with z. For task three, I'm getting the content and executing its index of method to see where the first occurrence of the letter x is within the string. Task 4 deals with dates, so I start by getting the current date and time and storing it in the variable d. I then execute the add years method, adding a negative 1, in effect subtracting a year. For task 5, I'm getting a date and then adding, well, subtracting 4 years, and then converting the result to a file system time format, 
to get the time from four years ago, something you might do during a file archiving operation.